Um, there's, there's, there's several major features that we, we have to um, discuss to see whether they should be implemented in any new next generation model. And um, one of them is the random effects. Another one is um, stock and species structure. Uh, another one is spatial. Um, it seems as though the random effects one is, is, is important. Um, now the issue there is that you need to have some of these um, you know, specialized software like TMB or, or the, um, particularly with, it has both automatic differentiation and the Laplace approximation and sparse matrix uh, algebra and things like that. Um, so does that mean that we have to go with TMB or are there other, other options out there that would be good at alternatives? Anders, what do you think? I, I mean, you can do it in AD model, but it's just slower. Um, ATL, I, I assume, will at some point have the random effects all yeah. Yeah. So is, is everyone in, in an agreement that we should have random effects in the next generation general models? Well, I certainly agree that we should have it in there, but it's unclear to me how it can work in the kind of model configuration, the kind of dot data moderate, data light model configurations of the highly multi-fleet configurations, you know, many and, uh, you know, as we move into age length models, the, the complexity of models in other dimensions are not the kinds of models that are being you know, tested and evaluated using random effects today. So I just don't know. Um, yeah, so I, and I, I guess I feel as though we'll need to have the ability to turn off random effects in some circumstances if we're gonna have a model that's gonna scale to data moderate, data limited situations uh, until we know better on how to do it. Yeah, so, so TMB, uh, as Anders showed, you can turn the random effects on and off. It's just a simple one component of a line of code. Um, yeah, so it's obvious that you're not going to use random effects for every model, and, and you probably don't want to use random effects when you're doing some initial testing because you want to maybe um, have a faster model to look at things. Um, so I don't think that's a big issue. All right, And it seems as though, from what Anders said, that having random effects implemented but not using it in, in TMB doesn't actually cost anything. So, so that's a benefit, yeah. No, if you, don't, if you don't have random effects, then you will expect the same run times as ADMB, unless it's a big matrix model, then TMB is faster. So um, does anyone else have any comments on on including random effects? Yeah, no. Yeah, and TMB comes with the map, map procedure, so it's really easy to turn, to get, to turn random effects off and just, just map them off. And, and so it's not, you know, probably have a switch in there whether you evaluate the random effects, the conditional likelihood so I do that I mean you know so I probably abuse maps I mean ever I have a parameter for every every observation and then it's just math to be it's, it's a bunch of error code to constrain things okay anyone else want to comment okay so oh yeah um Brian uh, it's, yeah, it's not just turning off random effects either. The map is used for turning off any parameters. So yeah. that's how WAM is done. We map given whatever, you know, options in the R model specification, like function, you just turn different parameters off or on. 
both random or fixed picks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so other than TMB and um, the software that Matthew's working on, are there other software, is there other software out there that would be appropriate for developing a, the next generation model? Um, I mean, I know, what is it? Uh, is it Jabba is done in bugs? Um, but I'm guessing bugs is probably not the most appropriate for this, for, for large models anyway. Jags, you know, yeah. Well, okay. Well, it's good. We've limited it to two options. So, <laughs> um, so the other thing was um, multi-species, multi-stocks. Um, a question for, oh, okay. Anna, uh, Anna. I, I think Matthew would agree that, that ATL is not ready now, mm -hmm. but expecting it to be at some point, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, whenever I can get some of Casper's time, yeah. 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 Um, so, so with respect to multi stocks, multi species, um, Craig, when you when you presented yours, um, you had the general partition, right? And that was for every single partition. Was that for sex and age and length and everything, or is it just for some partitions? And and the other partitions were actually fixed partitions in the model, a bit like say multi-fan CR where you have the age partition, then you had the uh, area partition and the area partition was turned into a general partition. So you'd have some partitions that you had to be implemented in the model. You didn't necessarily have to use them, but they were already there in the code. And then there was this other partition that you could set up for different types of uh, partition. Yeah, um, the, so A, so part, each, like a, we call them a category. So a partition mm -hmm. is made up of um, user-defined categories. Okay. Um, and each category has a vector, numbers at age, and numbers at length. Um, okay. um, so so the, the categories kind of abstract, but they all card around a vector of numbers at age and mm -hmm. numbers at length. Okay. So Nick, is that similar to what you've got then? Uh, what what other partitions have you got that aren't part of the general um, area partition? Yeah, so as I showed in the presentation, the the core structure is a hierarchical partitioning by region, um, time period, and area. Oh, sorry, region, time period, and age, um, and then we superimposed upon that either species, stock, or sex. So. Um, it's it's a structural partitioning process, which I suppose is what you had in the original Castle, Craig. So um, yeah, that that's a clear difference between how Castle Two does it and how it is in Multifan CL. And and so in both of those models, are you able to have um, like a, for for your um, areas category? Can you have six and um, species at the same time so you can have multiple instances of, of that general partition? Conceptually, yeah. Um, what we had, as I explained there, was we adapted the area or region partition so that it would emulate um, stock sexes or, or species. Um, conceptually, yeah, you could have upon that two levels, say stocks and sexes uh, by area uh, time period and age, um, using the sharing of the parameters part, uh, feature to allow you to have the fisheries specific to the, you know, say stocks and sexes within that structure. Um, but it, yeah, it, it's a bit of a stretch in terms of just organizing all of your uh, parameterization so you're doing it correctly for the stocks and the sexes or the species and the sexes. But as I said, we haven't actually developed a model that would have that, but yeah, that could be a project. So, so most of the work is setting up and defining the transition between the, the partitions, basically between the areas, um, aggregating data predictions across those regions and or areas. And then there's probably something else as well, right? And so that would require a whole lot of coding to make that general. And I think in um, Castle 2, um, 
if I recall correctly, there's a there's like you have it in that um, language to be able to do that, right? To tell it how to. Um, yeah. You don't have a do do you have like a default? So if you say this is sex, it cr creates those for you automatically, so that you have to be. Well, I get. I guess you can, maybe it's a hermaphrodite or not. If it's a non hermaphrodite, then you can't move between the sexes and you can't move from that yeah, sex that, partition to another, like an area partition, right? Um, yeah, well, I, so Scott was pretty clever and because um, you can see like the way we focus up the partition, that can explode. You know, you got region, um, stock, set. Um, and all of a sudden your partition starts to um, grow and and then so he created a whole lot of shortcuts which you you would need for something like Castle 2 like a um, move from you want to move all individuals from area A to area B you don't want users to have to write you know male west you know then you start getting these ridiculous configuration um, and so there was, there's a lot of work that has gone under um, keeping inputs readable um, with this kind of, and not, it can be kind of frustrating, this real general partition concept. Yeah, let me just report out the comparable configuration in SS. Uh, all of the biology stuff gets collapsed into one dimension of the annual age array. So sex, settlement time, growth mores, sub mores, all that stuff just gets collapsed into one dimension of the annual age array. They're all just stacked with pointers to get to them. And then there's another dimension for area. So it's basically time area G. I probably drift off during the discussion, but did we, is, is the multi-species uh, agreed? Is that something that is clear or was that, uh, it's a question from my side. <laughs> okay, so, well, I, I agree on something. I don't know about the rest of the, the, the workshop, but if I you think, agree, then. Yeah, I think that yes, we definitely need to have a petition that relates to stock, species, and everything implemented in the general model. The question is, is it fully implemented when you get the first version out, or is it just the architecture allows it to be there? So for example, um, if you wanted to have a multi-species model of biological interactions, maybe not, not the, most, the highest priority for, for the model to start with, but you probably want to make sure that the functionality is there that if someone wants to go ahead and implement it, they can. But you might want to have um, multiple stocks or um, multiple species where you have technical interactions, which are uh, sort of maybe less complicated to implement and also less likely to cause problems when you're trying to actually estimate the parameters and everything like that. I agree with you. Yeah, there, I mean, there's implications for how you then also design the the data inputs for it so that because you need to have species identified uh, in some way with each datum and those data those observation uh, events that collect multiple species at the same time uh, those also will need you know, some degree of identification so this is an important decision to make early on so that as the IO system gets devised uh, everything can work together seamlessly it's not too much work to add it on later. Yeah, I also think that there has to be some kind of language underlying all this that is able to be easily implemented to um, have the transition between all these different um, partition types. Yeah. So any other questions?
or comments on, on multi-species. So does anyone have an opinion on whether we should have a general partition that looks at not necessarily age or, or time, but looks at say some of the other partition types like uh, stock and, and sex and species? Or should we specifically implement them all as partitions that are defined with certain characteristics? I don't think, I don't see why we need to decide. I think that, that's, well, something, that's, yeah, something we should, that's, that's something that we should leave for people that know about it, know about how to implement it. I'm talking about the software engineers and you know, software architects, because they, they would probably have solutions that we don't even think about. Well, perhaps at the back end, I think it's called the back end, where, where all the um, coders, maybe there is a general partition, but at the front end, there may be fixed partitions so that it makes it easier for the input and, and that to be done. But then that's all that's doing is translating it into this general partition, right? And that would have, have the rules that says if this is a sex partition and it's not a hermaphrodite, it doesn't change between sexes. And so that's a parameter that is always fixed. Otherwise, if you, I think if you looked at what um, Craig was presenting, you have to do a whole lot of definitions. I mean, it would be easier just to say this is sex and it's non hermaphrodite and it automatically goes off and does it. And then, then you're more interested in, you know, how you define the possible um, um, transitions between the partitions and how the possible aggregation of data and things like that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, those are really good points. I remember talking with um, Alistair Dunn years ago about when we're, they'd done, made, him and Scott and um, Sophie Mormet as well had done a lot of the development on Castle 2 early on. And this was kind of a philosophical point about designing Castle 2 and with no defaults at all. So almost the, the opposite of how Castle, Castle 1 was put together and sitting around knowing that we would have this conversation like we're having right now. It's like, you can basically create this thing to do anything, um, whether that makes sense and whether you should. So I remember Alistair talking about, you really do have to know what you're doing from a stock assessment point of view and how you understand a stock and the population structure to then put these models together. And so you start from that basis and then when you're designing this model and adding structures around it so that people can understand it and putting templates together and using that to enable users that maybe don't have the understanding or the knowledge or the deeper understanding of the black box to actually be able to code it, your um, user files and input files from scratch, then they have these templates that are designed to help them use it. So, yeah. So we're working on that, <laughs> thinking about it. Yeah, and that kind of reminds me of what Rick has done for, I think it's the 3D Smoover or whatever it is for selectivity, where you have some kind of option where you run the model and what it does is it automatically creates the data, uh, the control file component as a, def as a default, yeah. yeah, 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 and then, yeah. yeah, and then you can go back and modify it, yeah, I mean, it's a text file, it's a bit clunky, but um, I'm guessing you could do something similar to, to in the castle, sort of, um, more of a language-based, um, or English language-based system, and then set that up, and then you can start modifying it from there. Okay. Any other comments? No. That was on um, stock structure and partitions and stuff. But now we can transfer to another topic if you want. Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, I'd like to hear other people's thoughts on whether we want a model that can do absolutely everything. Looking at some of the things in that list, do we want a sophisticated model like stock synthesis or SAM or CASEL to be able to do data poor methods? Um, or is it kind of overkill in a sense to be using a complex model and turning off almost all of its features? Um, same with um, separate production delay difference models. I mean, they're, they're pretty straightforward models and there are heaps of pieces of software that can, can do those things. But at the other extreme, I have a hard time imagining uh, some of the sophisticated single species models that we've got having multi-species capability, yes, I could imagine it for two species, possibly even three. But I think you almost run into more problems. I'm one of those old fashioned people who actually believes that a good, um, an eco ecosystem approach to fisheries is to do really good, incredible single species stock assessment, that that's an essential component of an ecosystem approach. And then you embed it with all of the other components. I haven't yet seen a multi-species model that was able to output, if you like, things that could lead to tactical decisions. Um, but if it happens, sure, then maybe we can take the next step and put them together. Um, so if I look at that whole list, um, I think the very simple things, I don't know, should, um, Castle batter spit out a yield per recruit. I suppose it should better do the calculation correctly. Rick and I discussed that the other day. Um, you'd be a bit worried if it wasn't. Um, I think age and length should definitely be included. Um, time steps should be able to be variable. Density dependence should be allowed. I, I, I think when myself and the colleague answered your questionnaire in the Excel spreadsheet, we thought every, if you like, single species um, uh, variation, you know, different random effects, yes, you know, yes to everything when it, when it came to multi-species. Same with meta-analysis. Um, if you want to use data from elsewhere, do it outside the model and, you know, create a prior or something like that and use it as an input to the model. But I'd be really um, interested, and I've attended the minority of the talks, I'm afraid. I'd be really interested in hearing other, other people's views on, on, you know, should it go from the very simple to the extremely complex? Um, or should it focus on something in the middle that's just focused on single species, which is my view, but I'm willing to be persuaded otherwise. So I'll, I'll summarize a little bit on some of the things that you may have missed. So um, at some stage we had a discussion whether it was going to be, we're talking about a general model or a general modeling framework. And so with the frame, so general model is obvious it's something like stock synthesis. With the framework, it's something more like FLR where you try and standardize input and output. And so you might have multiple models and they could all use the same diagnostics tools and display tools and data input and output. Um, the data poor methods, um, the thing that we talked about there was um, a lot of data poor methods, um, it's really hard to know what they're assuming, but often you can actually implement them in the um, general age structured stock assessment model. And then if you do that, the, the um, assumptions are more explicit. And also you can add additional data that you may not be able to put in the data poor methods and you can play with the different assumptions too to see how sensitive they are. So as the question is, you might as well, if you've got this general model, you might as well come up with ways to do the data poor methods in there so you can get a whole range. And um, Chantal gave a nice presentation on that. I'll let other people, um, Kathy, you have a comment. Just in relation to that complexity, um, for me, thinking about these models and certainly approaching Castle 2, and not so much in the design of the models, but the use of them is, as they become more complex, how do I understand what I'm getting out the other end? 
and when I'm trying to look at the challenges of um, estimating recruitment, natural, natural mortality, um, growth, um, understanding how I'm weighting the data in the models and how that affects what's going on. And as we incorporate more and more complex complexity and we try to um, meaningfully um, suck up variation and understand what's going on there, um, it becomes more and more difficult to understand what's coming out the other end. So um, keeping that in mind when, when we're designing things and when we're designing user templates that I know we're not trying to hide the complexity but in effect that's what's happening. So how do we if we're supplying those templates so that it's enabling people to use these complex models, what do we supply out the other end to understand what's coming out of these models as well? Ian, this is maybe a little bit of change of subject, but on the question of, it seems like people have some discomfort at the line between single species and multiple species, but I'd be curious to know if there's opinions about the approach Anders described where essentially you have separate single species assessments that are somehow linked. And I, uh, Jim Thorson published a paper in 2013 where he had, I think, nine West Coast groundfish independent uh, stock synthesis models that were linked through an environment, environmental index of, of recruitment. So it, it was just an iterative process of running all nine models in parallel you know, and then sort of updating them with this shared recruitment index where it was really inefficient, but I think in a cloud computing world that could be done really well. So I, I think if, if, if single species models can be adequately linked to each other, we don't really have to think as much about creating a master multi-species model. Yeah, Rick. until you want to build in a explicit mortality function of species A affecting species B, uh, you know, then it's, then they're so tightly linked. I don't see how you can do it uh, externally. I, mean, you, I, I suppose you could do a random effect on survivorship of the prey species and then somehow create a linkage between the abundance of the predator on the, uh, that random effect for the prey species, but I uh, don't like it nearly as much as looking at the mortality effect of predator on prey. Uh, Nesta? Uh, about this, this issue with uh, multi-species and single species and how you do it, my, my understanding here, and, and that's what I understood from your reply, is that we are not worried about what we can do now. We are worried what if we are going to need that in the future. Honestly, I don't think how we can say that we are not going to need mixed fisheries, multi-species in the future. So uh, even it's, it's a matter of, you know, every, like you said, having the capacity to develop it in the future whenever that future comes. But, and, and that's my take on this, not, not how we can do it now. Um, related to that, someone was mentioned, and it might have been Anders, that um, we should be planning for the next generation computers, not for the current computers. So perhaps that we don't have enough memory and speed and, and um, threads and stuff like that right now, but you know, in 10 years' time when this model is still being used, we might be able to... That's right, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, one thing I didn't mention before when I was answering Pamela's question is like the set of production models and delay difference models. I personally don't think we should be using them, but other people might. Um, and so that comes into the, the framework. So you might have a, you know, a comp comprehensive surplus production modeling package like Jabber or something that's in that framework and you can actually share the data and output and, and link them. Um, it may even be linked to the MSC, so that could be the estimator where, you know, the next generation model developed um, the operating model and things like that. So um, we should keep that in mind when we're doing this. It may not necessarily be a part of your general modeling project, 
but you should be linking and collaborating with other people that are creating the frameworks so that your model can be used in their frameworks. And so that's where um, coming up with standards for data um, input and output. And I think Ernesto was talking about um, databases. So rather than just having text files have databases and, and, and as FLR, they have classes for data classes and things which force you into a certain structure. So it actually makes things um, um, compatible and standardized. And then um, with respect to the uh, multi-species models, I, I definitely think that we can probably all agree that we should at least have the ability to input a time series of biomass from another species into the model and have that affect uh, natural mortality and or recruitment or whatever the, the um, biological, inter biological interactions would, would um, be affecting. And maybe in a more direct way rather than the way it's done in some places is like an environmental time series or a fishing fleet or, you know, some kind of, um, it's, it's probably doing the right thing. It's just the way that it's implemented just makes you feel funny when you're implementing it, right? Yeah. Okay, anyone else got any comments? Okay, so the other big component is spatial structure. And we, we've discussed it a little bit, but, uh, and a lot of the models have it, so Stock Synthesis has it, um, Castle has it, Multifan CL has it, um, Gadget has it. So a lot of them have it. I'm not sure if they've fully implemented everything that people want and if there's any issues. Does, does any one of those um, modeling frameworks know of any limitations of their, their framework and the way that they've implemented um, spatial structure? Yeah, the limitation in SS, as I said in the talk, is um, that you really can't have area-specific spawn or recruit uh, because the equilibrium calculation is not closed form. And so you'd have to switch to some iterative approach to developing a uh, area-specific spawn and recruit relationship for equilibrium calculations. And you need that if you want to carry through the implications for MSY and everything else. Uh, otherwise, you end up just having to simulate it out for several generations, which is, you can do it that way, but uh, equilibrium solution is uh, much more elegant. So is that issue dealt with in multi-fan or gadget or castle? Well, we can at least have spawning stock, uh, have this relationship by area. That is true. But uh, uh, sort of my experience with using the area-based uh, parts of, of gadget is that it's, um, it can be cumbersome to define to define uh, many areas into 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 a model because you need to have need because the bookkeeping of the uh, of the parameters is uh, can become is cumbersome. Uh, you need to define migration matrices between each each of one of those boxes, and um, and you can run you run into a situation if you are not careful of having um, sort of mix messages from the migration matrices and even 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 maybe uh, increasing the population size but because the migration matrices is not uh, under certain circumstances it cannot be constrained to being being one um, that being that being said it's uh, it's fairly flexible how you do it but um, I would uh, I would yeah but there, there are, are these issues of, of trying to uh, keep the constraints on, on the parameters. Yeah, Pamela. I think the spatial structuring might become, is becoming quite important actually. And I mean, Rick's actually going to be 
next week involved in our Hokie review. Hokie is our biggest stock. Um, it's, um, but we've got had several stock assessments lately. As we're accumulating more data, and, and from more and more sources, um, we've got a lot of models that are essentially falling over due to spatial structuring issues. So it's the, um, it's the spatial structuring in the stock itself with, you know, pockets of large fish and small fish. And of course, by depth, they tend to be larger. And, um, and also the fishing fleets are larger vessels focusing on some areas, smaller vessels on others, and then the interaction between them. But um, I mean, I appreciate the point that when you've got, when you're trying to estimate things like natural mortality, selectivity parameters, migration parameters, um, and what, uh, recruitment, um, you know, all together, you tend to get a lot of confounding. Um, but the spatial, but we're, we're finding that with the spatial structuring we've got, we, um, we really are not getting good fits to some of our indices. So I know that um, Craig can probably speak to this better than me or even Kath. Um, I know that we can do the separate um, recruitment functions by area, um, do six specific migration, um, six specific selectivity can, um, and a number of other things like that. Um, and for our, our Hokie model, we actually have migration back and forth between fishing and um, spawning grounds and feeding grounds, and they fished on all of these. And we kind of have to have, and, and we've got surveys taking place in, on in all of the feeding and spawning grounds too. So it's pretty essential that we have spatial structuring in the model, I think. Although I'd love to find a way to avoid it and, you know, I, I, I mean, just because, it, just because it, it just makes things, you know, you're just trying to hold so many more variables in your head and fit to so many more things. Yeah, John. Yeah, thanks. Just on, on this issue, um, I, I think... Um, we certainly would like to move down the road of, of having area-specific stock recruitment and, 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 and look at ways of solving that equilibrium problem that Rick talks about. Uh, well, we haven't started that yet. But I think as we, we get into this stuff, and particularly as we start to learn more about stock structure, uh, at least in the, the, you know, for the species world that I live in, um, one thing that we're going to have to try to work in I think is things like natal homing and have have the models built in such a way that one can um, you know flexibly specify those sorts of movement behaviors and stock structure um, partitioning because uh, I don't think that's certainly not a feature of, of our models at this point. Okay yeah Matthew. An additional component that would be nice would be time varying movement that varies with either environmental covariates such as El Nino, La Nina type of thing, or just being able to specify different movement rates over time, just as that's, that's something we've been looking at trying to do um, yeah, in MFCL. So is there anything in stock synthesis that we shouldn't have? <laughs> well, you, you know, that, 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 those are easy to get rid of selectivity. Is, is there, I mean, I, I guess the question is, how far overboard did I go on the, the time step issue in order to accommodate fitting the size comp data within a season. You know, it's one thing to fit to a size comp at the midpoint of the season. And if you want to create lots of seasons, well, that creates a lot of time steps. And that's, that's a lot of what we had. But that's what I, I worry about is whether the complexity that's there in order to do the really detailed time steps for tracking of the estimation of, of um, 
side pump data basically, uh, has that gone overboard? I still have a long list of things that I'd like to put in, but uh, that's the one that I think about uh, that may have um, caused more challenge. Because it, it, you know, it's there, it could be used, but getting the user community to use it, uh, use it wisely is, is, is harder. Okay, so we, we talked about spatial structure, but we didn't talk about temporal structure. So maybe you could spend like five minutes telling us what you have in stock synthesis for temporal structure. So it gives us an idea of what we might want to consider. Well, um, you can create as many seasons per year as you want. And the seasons could be of any real number duration. So you can create a two week season if you feel as though you need it. Um, and then the rest of the year could be the rest of the season. So there's that aspect of temporal structure, which I, I've seen in others. Uh, the new feature that's in SS3, uh, the 3.30 is the ability to invoke a concept sort of a non-explicit concept of subseason. So implicitly, models that have a season tend to do things at the middle of the season. So you have a, um, uh, you know, a mid-season is the, is the separation between, point between a early subseason and a late subseason. So that concept has been elaborated. So essentially there's subseasons within year uh, fishing mortality is continuous, mortality is continuous through the whole season, and then you can interpolate to any particular subseason point to calculate an age length key at that point in time. So if, for example, you had an annual model and you potentially wanted to look at um, uh, size comp data at each month of the year, we could tell the model that there's 12 subseasons. So now it, it knows it needs to be able to, if there's an observation, to calculate an age length key for that time point in that year in order to create the correct expected value for it. So that's the granularity in time. So it's, it only calculates that age length key at that particular point in time if there's an observation there that calls for it. Otherwise, it just does it basically once per year because it needs that for everything else. So why would you think that fishing mortality would be continuous during the season while the length frequency was taken at the start or the end of the season? They kind of, because you'd think that the fishing mortality might actually be, you know, different in different parts of that season. So then it, it would affect the length comps. So, I mean, what, what are you trying to gain with this? What I'm trying to gain is just the fact that the fish are growing and we, they're noticeably growing. Um, if you think that fishing mortality rate is not continuous during your season, then you just need to create finer seasons. And then you just input the amount of catch in your finer seasons and it'll calculate appropriate Fs to match that finer scale, but within what's a season, um, you know, to do anything other than Z is constant throughout the whole season, anything different than that is pretty challenging to, that doesn't pass Occam's razor, right? So continuous Z during a season, and then within that season, be more tactical on exactly when the observations occurred. So it interpolates mortality to that point in time and it interpolates growth to a subseason um, that is close to the observation in order to get the size and age lined up. And you know, it's very noticeable effect uh, in some circumstances when fish are growing faster. And so this is an efficiency thing so that you wouldn't have to do the calculate the seas, the, the sub seasons every time. It's only just when you have that one composition. Yeah, Kathy. I think if we go back to the question of time steps, I think you should almost ask the bigger question, which is 
uh, do you want to include hard to age species, invertebrate species into your next gen assessment? Um, cause that, uh, and, and, do you, and particularly if you want them to come from the tropics and subtropics. Because as soon as you do, you say yes to that answer, you immediately have quite small time steps because um, everything happens so much faster. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of things that come out of that answering that question, yes. There's immediately, we need to have an environmentally driven something because um, in many of the tropics and subtropics, things are highly driven by the environment. Um, you know, so, and things happen really fast. So all your dynamics have to be in a short time step. And the hard to age, it brings in, you know, all your sort of complications of length, no age. So I, I think it's more kind of like what kind of fisheries are we looking at covering in this assessment? And then what are the consequences that comes from that? And I would have liked to think that we would like to include length-based assessments, tropical species and subtropical species. And I think therefore, we absolutely have to be able to change the time step to whatever the user thinks is appropriate for their species. And, and that also relates to the depletion, in-season depletion estimators that we saw earlier in the week. Yeah, yeah John. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, we have something similar in, in multi CL with um, fairly flexible specification of the periodicity of fishing events and their timing within a year or within a season or, or, or whatever. Um, and the rationale for doing that is that sometimes um, you might want to break down your fisheries data, including your composition data, um, on a monthly basis uh, or something like that in order to extract more information on growth if you're trying to estimate growth from the size data. So that was, I think, our original rationale in, in having flexibility um, to do that. Then the temporal specification, the other temporal specification is in the dynamics uh, which is linked to the periodicity of recruitment that you're assuming. And then that determines, you know, how you're gathering and tracking numbers at age and fishing mortality at age. But you can have fishing events that are at a finer, you know, glanular, glanularity um, that, than that. And that was originally motivated by trying to see better growth signals, tracking modes and the like. Okay. So related to that, um, Rick, can you explain the birth season? timing and how that relates to times. Don't even have to jump in with it. He asked me for it. Um, so the other complication, and it's, it's another complication that comes in mostly with models that have a lot of size data. It's a tuna model, uh, a challenge. Um, the, the challenge is, is fish are not born instantaneously at one point during the year, and it's not the same date every year. I mean, you, you just see it in the data, you know, it bounces around a bit. And so, you know, when the fish are starting to grow is essentially another random variable. Uh, we tend to see it as the size, the, the, where is the size mode of young fish, but it's mostly, it's when were the young fish born, not how fast they grew when they were really young that is driving uh, that kind of phenomenon. So yes, I, I have some uh, capability for, um, you know, specifying the birth date. Um, I have some capability for, and I, I now term them settlement events. Um, and you can have multiple settlement events. So basically the total recruitment is broken up among multiple settlement, settlement events. Uh, but now you have, you know, a bunch of more partitions and you know, you got a fair random effect for which of the, say, three settlement events this year are going to get most of the recruits versus when are they going to show up next year. So you, you really have increased the, the dimensionality in order to deal with this issue of, you know, when most of the recruits were born um, is something that is variable. And you see it in, in the data. And, you know, I tried to create a capability to deal with it. I, it's not as elegant as I'd like it to be, but um, it is something I've tried to deal with. So does anyone have any 
comments on that? Yeah, come on. I just have a quick question for Rick. Um, do you think it would, well, it would be simpler, but would it actually be useful or um, valid to do a little bit more outside of the model, like perhaps something to do with, something to alleviate the need to, you know, have so many steps in your um, length, uh, in, in your seasons, how many, so many seasons in the year? Well, it does when you adopted the philosophy long ago, make the model match the data, not the data match the model. Uh, it does follow along with the general move away from doing age slicing with the length data and then give the model ages as if they were aged. Um, but that would be the alternative is to turn the lengths into ages outside the model and then you run the model off of ages. Okay, any other comments or questions? We can change topics. Okay, I, I got a question for Rich. So um, archival tag data is something that hasn't been used that much in, in assessments. I mean, there's been a few applications and, and uh, it's all approximations, you know, and things like that and binning time periods and all that. So is there anything that's not currently in like stock synthesis or Castle or Multifan CL that we need to make the most out of the archival tag data? Yeah, I mean, I do think to make the most out of them, they do need a specific likelihood because they're just, like I say, they're, they're conventional tags plus. So I think if you wanted to make the most, it doesn't have to be exactly the way we talked about it in my talk yesterday, the other day, but I still think it needs something that isn't there. And the same goes for making the most of tag data when you don't have reported rates. Because that, often that's why it doesn't get used and it seems a shame because it can be highly informative on movement with everything you have in the model, even with relative views on reporting rates. So I think there's a few things you could do, like recapture only models and things. But does it, does it just require adding on a, a different likelihood for the current way we model tags as a sort of separate partition or do you need something different? Do you need finer temporal scale? Or is there anything that you can think of that might complicate the, the general model? I think if it, if it would fit into the models, if you had that additional information, like you've said, if only I had reporting rates, I could use it. All the ingredients are there. I mean, everything I put up the other day is based on transition matrices that they don't have to be time invariant. They can vary with size, but they're things that are usually embedded within models with spatial structure. So I'm not sure it really needs that much. It's basically an additional likelihood, given you know the structure of the data. Most of the work done with archivals and satellites and acoustic tags is, is to get it into a format to then put it in. I was fairly blase about that the other day, but that's a lot of the work that needs to be done is to get it into a format that you can then use it. I would just add that the other aspect along tag lines, and this is something that we have um, uh, Ashley Novak working on with Gavin Bay, uh, and that's to uh, work out a way to put uh, growth increment data in, growth increment data from tags. So that's in the works. Hopefully in a, in a year we'll have that in. Okay, any other comments or questions? Okay, I'm getting a little tired, so I think we probably should break now. It's nearly ready to go to, to the dinner, so. Um, oh, oh, Jeremy, sorry. Sorry, sorry Matt. Um, I'd just sort of like to go back to the movement, and it's, it's more just to really throw some of my experiences out there. I mean, movement assumptions are, are really powerful and in terms of how they affect structure. And in my limited playing in this space, there are, I can only think of two dynamics um, that we actually deal with. And everybody else can think of something else that'd be great. But there's what we call diffusive movement, which is Markovian movement, where something doesn't really have 
prior knowledge of where it was before and it diffuses into a new area and becomes part of that new area. And that, if we stay within that space, we have stocks staying with areas. Um, but as soon as you start getting into natal homing or migration, things that where they have a prior knowledge of somewhere where they've come from and they still hold that identity, then you start, stocks no longer become areas. They're not synonymous with areas. You have areas that have mixtures of stocks. And that becomes a totally different ball game in terms of how you interpret it. Are you, to, are you managing an area which is a combination of stocks? Because that's what you actually see. Or are you actually managing uh, those stocks sort of still separately when you consider how they are exploited? I haven't got an answer to that, but that's a real complication as soon as you have what I'm calling home fidelity or natal or migration type movements in there. And so I'm not sure whether Castle actually does natal homing movement very well. Um, I'm not sure whether it actually does the simpler Macobian movement that well. I don't know how stock synthesis handles those two types, but they are fundamental. The other thing that um, we're seeing a lot in stocks is ontogenetic movement. And we've got a, a case in point with our big Cherokee fishery where they move between areas, you know, they, they recruit and they spend the first five years in this area and then they move further north and then they've got a, a broader range of ages. And then when you look at them in a particular end point, there's a full range of ages. And how do we manage that? Um, because you've got fisheries that are affecting them all, all across wider areas. So movement is really, fundamental to space and space and movement are intertwined and we need to make sure the next generation of models and even the current generation can handle those dynamics. Anyway, point of wisdom. Okay, thanks Jeremy. Um, any other comments? Okay, well thanks a lot everybody and um, I think Simon will put up information about the, um, the dinner.